to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 4. We welcome you to our study of the wonderful book of Hebrews. We want to encourage you, if you haven't got your Bible handy, to locate that as we're going to study together in the Word of God today. As always, we're glad that you joined us in our study. Uh, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you'd like to have a Bible study, learn more about their worship or the plan of salvation, or just come and visit with them, they'd be glad to have you in any of their assemblies, whether it be Sunday morning or Sunday night or for Wednesday Bible study. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who are concerned about souls and who are loving and kind in every way. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. In today's day and age where smartphones are growing so much, we want to encourage you to check out our latest app, both in the Apple Store and in the Android Store. The Gospel of Christ app is available, and that's a great tool to study from your phone. Or you can visit us on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a vast library of study material that would be great for helping someone in their study of the Word of God. We have all of our videos, audio lessons, transcripts, study questions, written material, and the good news is it's all free, available 24-7. You'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons, you can just go to our website, download, or go to our media request form, fill that out, or you can call or write to us and email us. We'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. Today we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. And this is such a, a powerful message about the superiority of Christ and Christianity. And we're right in the heart of talking about the superiority of Christ over various Old Testament figures and individuals that some of these Hebrew Christians may be holding up in very high esteem. Chapter 3 especially. We're going to deal with the idea of Christ being greater than Moses. And really, there are two very clear divisions in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, Christ is pictured as being greater than Moses. And in chapter 3 then, verses 7 through 19, our faith must be greater than the faith of those who followed Moses, who many times complained and murmured and didn't trust in God. And as a result, their bodies perished in the wilderness and many of them did not see the promised land. And so in chapter 3, we realize from the outset that Christ is our high priest, the apostle, uh, greater confession of our faith, and that He's greater than Moses, just like the builder of the house is more worthy in honor than the, the house itself. For example, Moses was just a servant in God's house. Christ is son over that house. I want you to look in Hebrews 3 and notice in verse number 3 the contrast given here. For this one, Jesus, is counted, has been counted, worthy of more glory than Moses. How? Inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Now watch verse 5. Moses indeed was faithful in all his house, in all God's house, as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken after. Now, verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. When we think about the contrast, 
between Moses and Christ, and Christ being counted worthy of more glory than Moses, being greater than Moses, we realize this is the case in that just as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself, or just as a son over the house has more honor than the servant in the house. What was Moses? Moses, don't get me wrong, to even be compared with Christ. We talk about figures like Moses and Joshua and Aaron and Christ being greater than them. Friend, don't misunderstand what we're saying here. To even be compared to Christ, even be in that comparison, what a wonderful thing that is. Moses, Aaron, uh, Joshua, great servants of God, but they're not even comparable to Christ. So what was that Moses we think about? Moses, according to the Hebrew uh, Bible and, of course, Hebrew history, he was a great servant in the house of God. I want you to think about all the things Moses did. Moses, being called off the backside of Midian, goes to Egypt during times of great persecution and bondage. He rises up as a deliverer of God's people, God working through Moses and working through Aaron, sends the ten plagues, and Moses stands up in the face of Pharaoh and says, let my people go. That's the message of God. Wow, what a great hero of the faith Moses was. Pharaoh succumbs to all those uh, signs and miracles, and it is Moses who leads that army of God's people through the dry ground in the Red Sea. The Egyptians are crushed in that. He leads them up to the, uh, to the mountain where they'll receive, Mount Sinai, where they'll receive the Ten Commandments. He put up with all the murmuring and complaining of Israel right up to the brink of the Promised Land. Moses was a powerful and very esteemed servant of Almighty God. But don't miss this. Christ is greater than Moses in that Christ is a son over his house. Moses is simply a servant in it. What's that mean? Christ is God. He's not a servant in the house of God. He is the son of God, which by default makes him God as well. What, think about these passages with me. Hebrews, or excuse me, Genesis 1 verse 26. God said, let us, what? Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Do you hear the plural, personal pronoun there? Us and our? Who is that us? Who is that personal, plural pronoun there? Hebrews 1 verses 7 through 12. To the Son, He says, God says, Your throne, O God. God refers to His own Son as God as well. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. John chapter 20, verse 28 through 30, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Friend, what we're emphasizing is the deity and the nature of Jesus as God Himself. You can't compare Moses with Christ because Moses was just a servant. Christ is God Himself, God in the flesh. And thus, the powerful lesson from Hebrews 3 is the superiority of Christ as God over Moses. And so, as we think about how does this teaching apply to us today, how did it apply to them? Friend, we realize this. Unlike the people of that day, we've got to listen more carefully to the Word of God. We've got to make sure that in contrast to the wanderers in the wilderness whose bodies perished and who died because of sin, we need to listen to Christ more carefully than these people listen to Moses. Notice Hebrews chapter 3, and I want you to look at what the Bible says in verse number 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, he says, lest there be in any of you 
an evil heart and unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. What about those people who followed Moses? A big, big majority of them perished in the wilderness because of their sin. Moses was a great leader and a great servant, but the people who followed Moses, their faith, often was not what it should have been. And so his encouragement to us, to Christians, especially to these people who are thinking about going back to the old Hebrew way of life is, beware, learn a lesson from these people who lost their lives because of it. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of us an evil heart of unbelief that causes us to depart from God. Rather, let's exhort, let's exhort, Let's encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest we be deceived, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so we've got to encourage, lift one another up, uh, make sure our faith is what it needs to be, and don't get drugged down by sin and all that it's going to do. Friend, let's realize this lesson as well. Christians need the help of other Christians. We are not put here to be independent, isolated, and an island to ourself and somehow think that we are big enough and strong enough to do it on our own. Now I realize I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4 verse 13, but friend I also want to realize this, we need the help and the encouragement of other Christians. This is why the Hebrew writer will say, exhort or encourage one another daily. Friend, here's what you can be sure of every day. Every day the sun rises, Satan has a plan. Satan is trying to bring despair and discouragement and sin and temptation into my heart and life and into yours. We need Christians who will pick each other up, who will pat each other on the back, who will encourage one another. That's the, the whole idea here is encourage. Hebrews 10, verse 25 and 26 again will say, encourage one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And so we want to love each other, we want to help each other, and we want to do what we can to lift each other up. Now I want you to notice Hebrews 3, verse 14. The only way that we can remain faithful to the end, the only way we can win, be victorious, is by remaining faithful to the end. Look at what the Bible says in Hebrews 3, verse number 14. The writer says, For we have become partakers of Christ, now watch the if here, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The writer says these Christians who are thinking about going back, it doesn't matter becoming a Christian. That's a big thing and that's important, but that's not what secures it, okay? It's great to be a Christian, but the only way you're going to win is if you hold fast your confidence to the end. This is the same encouragement of Revelation 2 verse 10. Uh, the writer John or the angel says to Christians in Ephesus, Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. Uh, no man putting hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He who endures to the end shall be saved is what the Lord would say. And so, good to become a Christian. It's the best life you can imagine, no doubt about it. But live it till the very last breath. That's how we make it to heaven itself. And what a wonderful blessing and encouragement that will be for every child of God. Then we turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 4. And in chapter 4, since we have just contrasted, since the Holy Spirit has just contrasted Christ as being greater than Moses, He then moves to that next person in line after Moses, the person who actually led them into the Promised Land, Joshua himself. Joshua was a great servant of God. And in the Hebrew mind, he's that one who took them across the Jordan into the land flowing with milk and honey, that Promised Land. And so now, Christ is going to be shown as greater than Joshua in that the rest He gives is greater than the promised land rest Joshua gave the people. Now, in Hebrews 4, verses 4 through 8, uh, there are three rests that are spoken of. There is the Sabbath day rest, which God rested on the seventh day. There is the Canaan land rest, of which the 
Israelites went into uh, that land flowing with milk and honey, the land of Canaan. But then there's a third rest that remains for the people of God, the rest that Jesus is leading His people toward. Notice Hebrews chapter 4, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 8 and 9. For if Joshua had given them rest, he, God, would not afterward have spoken of another day, the greater rest. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. This is a rest that occurred after Joshua gave them the Canaan land rest. And so you think about these in order. The Sabbath day rest, God rested on the seventh day. That would come first. You've got the Canaan land rest that Joshua gave the people of Israel. And yet God says, if Joshua were the one, God would not have spoken. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God coming. Future tense. That rest is heaven itself. Friend, what makes Christ greater than Joshua? Well, again, Joshua is a servant in the house. Christ is son over it, just like Moses. But Christ is leading us to a greater rest than the promised land rest flowing with milk and honey. When you think about the promised land, they still had to go in and drive out the enemy. There were still thorns and briars in their side. There was still sin and apostasy that would occur at times. Heaven's far greater than that. Think about the heavenly rest. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's a place where there's no more sorrow, death, pain, crying, sickness, sin. All the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. It's a place where God is. Matthew 6, verse 9, our Father who art in heaven. It's a place where saints of old are. Uh, they've gone to be with the Lord. It's a place where there is great joy and happiness and where we gather to worship and sing praise to Almighty God. Friends, Satan and sin and all of that is not there because God is. What makes Christ greater? Christ is greater than Joshua because the rest He's leading us toward is far superior than the Canaan land rest. It is the greatest rest of all, that heavenly rest. And along the way, the writer in Hebrews 4, as we think about this, this greater rest, it's as though the writer ponders that greatest rest and then he stops for just a moment to give us several helps and encouragements along the way to help us get to that heavenly rest. In fact, in context, there are four helps that are given to the child of God to help him get to that heavenly rest. What are they? Number one, to help us attain that heavenly rest given by Christ, we've been given the all-sufficient Word of God. Look at Hebrews 4 verse 12. The Bible says this, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How can I get to heaven, that heavenly rest? Well, friend, you've got the perfect roadmap. You've got the perfect guide. You have the all-sufficient Word of God. It's alive, it's powerful, it's sharp in that it pricks our heart. It helps us to discern right and wrong and live the way God wants us to live. The, the Bible says in Romans 1.16 that the gospel is God's power to salvation. Uh, the Scripture clearly teaches in Psalm 119.105 that the Word of God is that lamp to our feet. And it's the light to our path. As I'm walking the Christian light or walking the Christian way, I've got the perfect light to keep me on the path that I ought to go. Uh, the Word of God has everything we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. And friend, it makes us complete before God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17. And so in, in heading for that promised land of rest, the heavenly rest, let's make sure we take the road map, God's Word, along the way and live by it and follow it to heaven itself. Secondly, as an encouragement to that heavenly rest, we're reminded of the all-seeing eye of God, which helps us along the way as well. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. The Scripture then says this, And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. 
you know, as we think about help along the way, initially a person may say, well, that really don't sound too helpful. But isn't it in a couple of ways? To know that God sees and knows all is a help in the following ways. Number one, it reminds me of a certain sense of accountability. God sees and God knows. Therefore, I need to be careful how I live my life. Uh, nothing's going to be hidden from God. Uh, the, we're not going to escape with sin and God not know about it. Do not be mocked. God, God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. Galatians 6, verses 6 through 9. And so there is that sense of accountability along the way. But friend, notice, think about this also. The fact that God knows and God sees. For the child of God who's trying to live right and walk in the light, isn't that an encouragement? To know, hey, God knows what I'm going through. God sees that I'm trying to walk in the light. The, 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 the challenges I'm facing, the difficulties here, the, the things I have to put up with, that doesn't go unnoticed by God. And there's help to be had, there's help to be offered, and the fact that I'm not alone and that God knows that, it ought to be an encouragement and an uplift to every one of us in this life. All right, let's notice a third thing that encourages us toward that heavenly rest, and it's this. We have the perfect, Example to follow to get to heaven itself, the one who's already there, the forerunner, Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Friend, the encouragement that we have as we try to get to that heavenly rest is, look at those steps. Look at this path that's been... Somebody's gone down this path. Somebody's been there. There are shoe treads, shoe prints that I can put my feet in, and here's the path to follow that's going to lead you there. Jesus Christ, He came to this earth. He lived as a man. He faced temptation as a man. He walked the path that man walks. And yet he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. The writer says, to make it to that heavenly rest, you've got to consider Jesus Christ who went through what you've went through. And He prepared the way. He blazed that way. He was the forerunner. He made the path. And the encouragement is, although we've sinned and fallen short, through Christ, with His help, and by following His example, we can make it to heaven. Friend, let's not be a defeatist. Let's not say it's too hard. Let's not throw in the towel. Let's not give up and say, I just don't think I can do it. Let's say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. With God's help, by following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by putting my feet in His footsteps, 1 Peter 2, 21, one day I can make it to heaven itself. Now that fourth encouragement, no doubt that will help us get to that heavenly rest, is found in verse 16. I want you to see it with me in Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse number 16. The Bible then says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friend, not only do I have the example of Christ to help me get to heaven, I have the power and the privilege of prayer to help me get there as well. What a wonderful blessing this is. Listen to these words again. We come boldly, not, not with a sense of cockiness, but we have the privilege as God's children to come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? To obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Friend, there is help to be offered from the throne of God for every Christian who's headed toward that heavenly rest. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, Men ought always to pray and never lose heart. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. James 5, verse 16. And thus, as we think about our Christian journey, toward that promised land of heaven.
let's make sure that we utilize the Word of God that we're encouraged by the fact that God knows and God sees, that we're following the powerful example of our Lord and that we access the power and privilege of prayer regularly. Friend, we want to pause for just a moment and think about our own lives and where we are with Almighty God. Friend, if Christianity is that great and if there really is a place called heaven, don't you want to go there? Don't you want to live with God? forever. If you're not a Christian, we kindly ask today, why not? Heaven is going to be so wonderful. The Christian life is the best life you can live. Won't you become a child of God? Someone says, well, I want to become a Christian. What do I do? Friend, let's hear it from the words of Jesus. First, you have to believe in Him as the Son of God. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. Once you've realized Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Son of God, you've got to repent of sin. The Lord said in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I've got to turn from sin and turn to God. Having repented of sin, the Lord said, We must confess Him before men. If you won't confess me before men, Jesus said, Neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, the Lord said, To be saved, to become a Christian, and to have our sins washed away, one must be baptized. Listen to the plainness, uh, simplicity of the words of Jesus. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. To be saved, you've got to be baptized. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Friend, if you are a child of God, you've already obeyed the gospel, then the encouragement today is keep pressing toward that promised land of heavenly rest. Don't give up. Don't go back. Don't let anything get in the way. Make sure that every day we do our best to live in such a way that we glorify God and that heaven is going to be our ultimate goal. May God help us to do just that. And we hope you'll join us next time as we study more together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.